So welcome, everyone. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about Arbea. It's a real-time analytics platform that we built at King. Yeah, just to get this out of the way, uh, the word Arbea is a word play on the, the word Bea, which is like a Swedish short for the sauce Bernes. So yeah, we thought it was funny. It, it isn't in, in reality. Yeah. So about me, uh, as, you, as you can see, my name is Jula. Uh, I work as a data warehouse engineer uh, now at King. Uh, I work in the streaming platform team, so we develop streaming applications and infrastructure and tooling for other teams at King, so they can build better games, analyze the data in real time. And I'm also an Apache Flink uh, committer, so I worked a lot on, on making Flink better, so, but now I'm, I'm building awesome applications instead. All right. So the idea of this talk is not to go into all the super technical details, because it's a very complex system, just so, you, so I can give you an idea of what we built uh, at King on top of Flink to give you an idea of the power of these uh, stream processing systems on what you can actually build uh, on top of them, and to maybe give you another angle on, on stream processing at a larger company, or how do you expose stream processing to, to the users uh, uh, that you have. So a few words about King, if you don't know the company. Uh, King. Uh, is an awesome company who is making fantastic mobile games. Uh, you probably uh, know the games that we built, Candy Crush, Farm Heroes. You probably know someone who plays them, or you've gotten a Facebook notification, an invitation to play Candy Crush in the past. Uh, but actually, King has over 400 million active users uh, every month playing the games around the globe. And these games uh, produce uh, around 30 billion events every day. So it's a lot of data to ingest and analyze for, for the game teams. And yeah, so we're trying to build uh, streaming systems uh, on top of all, this, uh, all these incoming events. So let's look at uh, what happens from, uh, from a streaming perspective. So in the left side, we have the game clients. Uh, sending the data whenever you play around in Candy Crush. There are a bunch of events generated for all sort of things that happen inside the game. Maybe you start, uh, start a new game, or you buy some gold bars to make us happy, or you fail and you try again, and uh, so forth. All of these generate these simple events that are from the clients sent to the game servers, and the game servers then write it to Apache Kafka. And if you're uh, thinking about a streaming use case, this is where you will probably tap into this uh, stream of data. And you will deploy some application uh, on this Kafka stream. Maybe this is a stateful application that, uh, that will accumulate some statistics from, for the users, track the progress, uh, generate some insight, uh, as they say it. Uh, but it's actually a hard problem, because if you think about keeping some aggregate statistics for hundreds of millions of active users, that actually is more in the orders of like billions if you say unique user IDs in the system over a longer period of time. Even if you keep very simple things, the state grows in the orders of hundreds of gigabytes, multiple terabytes easily. Yeah. And of course, at the very end of the pipeline, you have the game teams and different games waiting for the data uh, and waiting for the output of the processing jobs. So in order to, to tackle this general problem, uh, we use uh, Flink at King, uh, because uh, we think it's, it's very suitable for, for these sort of use cases. And let's look at how we actually use Flink in general uh, inside the company. Uh, we have our standalone Flink cluster. Uh, we, instead of deploying many Flink streaming jobs, we actually just run a few like, heavier, complex streaming jobs. Uh, with almost all of these, we use uh, the RocksDB state backend. And we actually built a custom like, uh, Java caching layer on top of this 
because it's very common that there are a small set of keys that are very active for a short period of time. If you think about some person trying to, to play a game, they play for uh, 20 minutes while they're sitting on the bus, and they might not play for, for the next couple of hours. Yeah. And of course, we have a lot of custom tooling around Flink, mostly operational features, handling uh, checkpoints and save points uh, to make the to make Flink production ready uh, for, uh, for our needs. Yeah. But this is just a general idea of what you might want to do at, uh, at King uh, with Flink, but this is not what I'm going to talk about today. Today I'm going to talk about a platform that we built for people inside King to, to get access to, to stream processing. And the main idea is that we want to ha give uh, data scientists and other like, statisticians, uh, game teams, a tool which they can use to write scripts very simply directly against the live event streams uh, without the knowledge of these complex uh, distributed systems. They don't, they, we don't want them to learn how to program in Java necessarily or, or how to use Flink because it's, let's be honest, it's complicated. And also, we don't want people to learn how to deploy uh, things on our currently running cluster, because that's also complicated. It's hard to manage uh, these jobs. It's much harder to manage and maintain uh, streaming applications that need to run 24-7 than deploying new Hadoop jobs. Everyone can do that. But keeping a job running for an extended amount of time, uh, for that you need a lot of uh, operational knowledge uh, about these systems. So. Uh, to tackle, tackle these uh, problems, uh, we've built a, uh, a platform where people can go up, uh, use a simple web interface, write some scripts in, uh, in a higher level DSL that we provide for, for people. Here they don't need to worry about that it's running on Flink. They don't need to know about how windowing aggregates are computed or what state is or how to parallelize computation. They just write a, a script, uh, our DSL is in Groovy, uh, and then they click the Deploy button on the list of jobs, uh, and now their job is running. They can see it on the front end, and when, if their job produces some output, maybe counts some um, purchases or aggregates some revenue, they get a clickable button instantly, and by clicking on it, they get a chart where, which they can look at, so this is very, very handy when they release a new feature and they want to monitor the Im immediate impact on, on the games. But beyond this, uh, we want to make sure that anything that they, uh, that they deploy is, is scalable and fault-tolerant. So if anything goes bad in the cluster, which they don't know it even exists, then their jobs should not be affected. So this is the main idea of Arbea, and we built it, we built it on top of Apache Flink. And it's a complex architecture. So on the bottom left corner, we, get, we have the games again. They send the events uh, through Kafka. And the central part of the Arbea infrastructure is the Arbea backend. It's actually the Arbea Flink uh, backend which is one streaming job, one Flink streaming job per, per game. Uh, so now let's focus on one game at a time. So let's say we have Candy Crush, and we have a Flink streaming job that serves as a backend for the Arbea platform running on top of Candy Crush. This streaming job will take care of both uh, receiving, the, uh, receiving the events and receiving the scripts uh, from the front ends. And it will actually deploy the new scripts sent by the users inside the job itself. Uh, this way, we create uh, data locality for the scripts, so we don't need uh, new scripts. Don't need to reconsume the data. We we practically send the scripts to the already running streaming job, and this way, deploying an additional script is almost nothing. It's just one extra iteration in the for loop, which uh, loops over and executes the actual user scripts. But of course, uh, 
this is a very heavy streaming job. It executes all the functionality that the framework provides. Uh, it keeps state for each user. For this, uh, we, uh, we use RocksDB. For the save points, uh, to, to be able to recover the jobs in case of failures, we use the distributed file system called Ceph. Um, you can think of Ceph as an equivalent to HDFS. We use this because this is what we've got. <laughs> there is no particular reason why we, why we use that. Of course, this uh, fling job writes output depending on the actual script. Maybe it writes something data to Kafka, aggregates to MySQL, or files to Hadoop. But this is the back end part. This is uh, what I'm interested in. But the actual end users uh, don't even know that this exists only when it's down, because then they know that, OK, something is wrong. I, I need to talk to Jula, because yeah. But the end user is on the, on the top right corner is a data scientist. It's a, it's a different kind of person. They, they, they're not necessarily good programmers. Some of them are, uh, but not everyone. They don't all know how to work with distributed systems. Uh, but then again, not every one of us knows how to work with these systems either. Uh, but what they know is how to write simple scripts that will do what they actually want. And the way RBA exposes it to them is by uh, the RBA front end, which, uh, which is on one side, an R we have an RBA web front end, where, which I showed you uh, previously, where they can go up, type the scripts, deploy, get, look at the data, export uh, the results in JSON formats or whatever. But they can also, uh, also programmatically deploy new scripts uh, through Python libraries uh, and so forth. So whenever they click the Deploy button in their front end, uh, it actually doesn't uh, communicate directly with the back end, because that would be very weird to implement. Uh, but instead, it communicates with the REST API. And the REST API will actually write the new deployments uh, to Kafka. So the communication between the, the front end and the back end is also asynchronous. Uh, this makes it uh, much easier to restart separate uh, components from each other makes them, the whole system more robust. There's also uh, a communication the other way, of course, because the back end uh, needs to send information about the current running scripts. If they started producing a specific output, they need to send this information to the front end so the front end can display it uh, to the user. So this is uh, the main idea of uh, the RBA architecture. So let's look at uh, the back end in more detail because that's what everyone is here for. Uh, so this is a very high level idea of, uh, of the RBA Fling backend. And the core, in its core, there is a fancy co-flat map operator. Uh, this co-flat map operator on one input receives the events and executes all the scripts for, uh, for this event that are already deployed. And on the other input, it will receive the new uh, script deployments. Uh, these are received as strings. Uh, and we will uh, compile them with the Groovy compiler inside the Coplat map uh, and add it to a list of currently deployed scripts. The other interesting thing here is uh, whenever we execute the user scripts on, si uh, on, this, uh, uh, on these events, we don't actually uh, execute the actions that the API specifies. So for instance, when the user writes to Kafka or increments a counter, we of course cannot uh, do these actions inside the Kafka.net operation because it would make it incredibly complex and super wasteful. So what happens instead? is whenever the user does some action in the API, we generate the, the specific output event. And downstream operators capture specific outputs. For instance, Kafka outputs are captured by a Kafka sync. So we can actually route the different API calls to different uh, downstream operators. So this way, we can actually have one fling job uh, for a game and affix a static API, uh, the static topology to execute all, uh, all our API uh, calls. Uh, the computation is distributed by the user ID of the events. 
So this is uh, the grain that we keep the state on. So people can also access user and build up user states uh, in their scripts. And as I said, aggregation happens downstream. So now that we have a, a high level understanding of what we're trying to do, uh, let's look at uh, the actual API and to maybe get some, uh, get some more insight about how the system works. So here we can see a very simple script uh, in the RBA DSL. Uh, is it visible even from the, the back rows? All right. Very good. So, uh, so this is a Groovy script that anyone uh, could write. Uh, in the simplest case, people need to define a processing method. This, uh, and what we do here is we take purchase events, uh, get the amount and the currency it was made in. So if you bought some gold bars in England, it would be... Uh, some amount and uh, pounds. And maybe we want to write this information, like currency amount, to a dedicated uh, Kafka topic called uh, purchases. And maybe we also want to actually count the number of purchases people made every 10 seconds. This is something that people do very often to, to track the impact of some A-B test uh, or some new feature. So here we just create a new counter and tell the system that this counter should be kept uh, on a 10-minute 10 level, a 10 minute window, and then we just increment the counter. This happens for every event, so uh, this will give us a correct count uh, of the purchases. So, but if you look at this uh, small script, uh, this is not like a fling job. Here, users don't need to to worry about the topology, how to read the event streams, how to actually write things to Kafka. They just tell the system. It's a declarative, uh, declarative API. They don't need to worry about extracting event time from the events or creating the window operators. They'll just tell the system that I want a counter uh, every 10 minutes, because this is what data scientists want to work with. They know what they want, and they want to get it in the, short, in the simplest possible way. So let's, let's actually step uh, through this script and see what happens underneath when we're executing uh, this script. So first, uh, we, of course, start by receiving this script as a string. We compiled the, the Groovy class, which actually compiles down to a Java class. Uh, and we actually use a, an annotation-based API so, so users can have multiple processing methods. And also, these annotations uh, let users specify explicit filter conditions. So for in this case, uh, the, we can specify that we're only interested in processing events that belong to this specific semantic class called uh, SC purchase. This just tells the system that we're only interesting, interested in purchase events. So other uh, stuff like game starts, uh, game ends are not interest, interesting for us. Uh, so now that our program can identify the method that the user would like to call for each event, it will look at uh, the method signature. Then again, this is not something fixed. You can put anything there that is accessible from the RBA API. You can, here we put directly the, the SC purchase event instance, the, the specific event type that we're listening to, and the output and the aggregator hooks that the context provides us. And since we know that this, this is the method that user wants to call, we know the parameters, we will actually co-generate uh, a Java class out of it that maps to, of course, a more strict interface, so we can work with it very simply. And the strict inter interface is the process event method with just an event and the context. And underneath, uh, the co-generated Java class will actually get the output and the aggregators from the context, map the event to the specific event type, and pass that directly to the user function. And this design is, uh, uh, is inspired by uh, some recent changes in the Beam API, where they introduced some uh, annotation-based uh, logic. And I think it, it is very nice because it makes the processing functions much cleaner, removes a lot of boilerplate that the users have to write. 
because in, in the previous version, we had this API with event and context. And in this script, our first two lines would be output out equals context get output. Uh, this is uh, unnecessary, because the system actually knows what the user expects. All right. The first in, in, very interesting thing uh, in this script is actually calling the write to Kafka event. Here the user says write to the purchases topic and some, some data. And what happens underneath is that we don't actually write anything to Kafka at this point. We just create a new output event which should be written to Kafka and with the necessary metadata that goes with this kind of output, in this case, the topic and the data itself, or the bytes. Uh, and then these events are output, outputted from the, the CoFlatMap operator, and we downstream filter these and send it to a Kafka thing that will just write it. So last bit in this uh, script is creating aggregators. Here, this is also very flexible. We just tell the system that we want a new counter called purchase count uh, that is aggregated every 10 minutes, and we just increment it. The story is pretty much the same here as with Kafka, with the additional note that while writing to Kafka would be possible at the operator, creating these aggregators is impossible, because if we want to have it distributed, then we can't really uh, count everything and on, on just uh, partial data or we would have to use an external database. So we would need to aggregate them inside MySQL, which would lead all to all kinds of uh, inconsistencies uh, when we face uh, some failures. So here, again, the aggregator call doesn't aggregate anything. It just creates an aggregate event, which tells the system what this is. Well, it's a new uh, aggregator input for uh, written, to be written to MySQL on 10-minute window called purchase count, and it aggregates one. And we actually use Flink window operators downstream to, to create these aggregates, and then later a sync that will write these outputs uh, to MySQL. Yeah. This sounds simpler than it actually is, because uh, if you think about your script, here you have 10-minute windows, but this could be a 20-minute window or a 30-minute window or anything. You can even specify the, milli uh, the milliseconds. So, so what, do we know, what do we do now? Do we have as many window operators as possible window sizes? This would, of course, be very, very stupid, and it's impossible to do. Uh, but we can actually play a nice trick here and, and implement our custom window assigner and use uh, the flexible windowing uh, uh, features that Flink provides to, to take care of this inside one window operator. So what actually happens is uh, we take these aggregate events that inside them specify the, the time window. And we have our custom window assigner. This is just a small snippet, the core logic of the window assigner. Uh, so basically, we will actually get the window size from the aggregate event. And then we will compute uh, the time window, the bucket it needs to be assigned to by the window assigner. And the only difference between this and uh, the standard tumbling event time window assigner is actually the first line, because whereas the, the tumbling event time window assigner gets this as a constructor parameter, we extract this uh, from every event. So this is a very simple yet clever trick to, to use the same operators that uh, Flink provides, but uh, do everything uh, uh, together. So here's the high-level view of what happens when you are creating aggregates. You get uh, the incoming uh, data. They're grouped into event time windows based on the, the timestamps of the actual events. Scripts create uh, different uh, window aggregators. They can be on different uh, window sizes. They downstream, a window operator does the aggregation based on the dynamic uh, window sizes. And then we, we pour all this data into MySQL uh, so we can make nice charts uh, out of it. And of course, MySQL is something that people like to work with, except if they're developers. Another feature that I've briefly mentioned is the possibility to, uh, to use states inside your scripts. I didn't have this 
uh, inside my example uh, program uh, because it would just make it complicated. But uh, in reality, scripts can actually create and read uh, user states uh, on the fly. Uh, and the way they work is we provide an abstraction called fields uh, for the users. So for each, uh, for each user, there is a set of fields. Uh, a, p small p a field is a piece of user state that is defined and is computed for each, users, uh, in the, each user in the system. Uh, and we store all these fields inside one fling value state. We actually serialize it ourselves into a byte array. Uh, we don't create a new value state inside Flink every time the user uh, creates a new field. Uh, this is uh, uh, more efficient this way because um, this also means that whenever the first script reads the state, we fetch it from RocksDB, and we don't need to do like another round trips for for all the all the fields that other uh, scripts might also read. So as I said, the states are kept per key inside in byte arrays, and they sit uh, on top of Flink's uh, RocksDB state backend with a custom cache implementation in between. Uh, the basic idea is scripts can read all the fields for a given user, uh, but they can only write their own. And the way the API is designed is that scripts update their state with up field updater functions, which are executed before the, proce the processors. So this way, we don't get this race between a processor updating a state and someone else possibly reading it. So this was uh, my intro to the, to the back end. Uh, some things uh, you might wonder about. Uh, can slow scripts affect other scripts because they are deployed together? Uh, the short answer is yes, of course. Uh, we are working on this. We have some ideas on how to fix this. It's, it would be too early to, to say anything about this. Uh, but of course, what we can always do is uh, create separate tests and live environments. So we can dedicate resources to specific uh, teams or people where they can uh, explore their scripts, um, uh, explore some ideas, and then when they're happy with it, deploy it in the live environment. Another question uh, that might be interesting is, what does the backend know about the scripts that are running? So basically, we need to, and we try to track everything uh, that is uh, possible to know about the scripts. So what states it set, what outputs it produced. On one hand, we need this uh, to, to propagate this to the front end so we can uh, give a nice user experience. So when you start writing to Kafka, we can immediately show it on the front end so you can maybe tail your Kafka log that you produced. Uh, but it's also important for the system to, to track these kind of things because, for instance, if a failure happens on one parallel instances of this uh, core flatlap operator, then we actually need to propagate uh, this failure to other uh, subtasks and remove that script and mark it uh, as failed. And then this, the exception that caused the failure needs to be propagated back to the front end so people actually can look at the stack trace and, OK, look at, yeah, this was the line uh, in my Groovy script that caused this failure. And maybe the last uh, most interesting question is, is RBI useful? Is, any, is it any useful compared to, to writing Flink streaming jobs? And I think we can agree on that it is extremely useful. Because writing and maintaining streaming jobs is hard, uh, especially if this is not your full-time job and you're a data scientist who, want, who just wants to get a quick look at what's going on in the game. This way, they can actually write a streaming job in, in 10 minutes and deploy it and get immediate results. Uh, and this, of course, this gets even worse. Uh, when you try to write a very complex job that does all these kind of things, keeping state, writing to databases, a lot of uh, tricky details about setting up these components. If you've ever written uh, um, a Flink thing that writes to MySQL, you know the pain of debugging like, the different connection problems, 
uh, the JDBC APIs. It's, it's, not, it's not as simple as it looks. So I would like to close this talk with uh, showing the, the physical plan that RBI generates. Yeah. Uh, here, uh, here, you can, here all, some operators are already uh, chained together. So this is the physical plan that you get from the, from the Flink front end. I hope it uh, resonates with whatever uh, I've said earlier. Uh, on the left side, uh, we get the job deployments, we get the events. Uh, here is the central Coplet Nap operator that executes uh, the processors, co generates the Java classes. And downstream from this, uh, this is where the aggregation happens. We have a window aggregator. We have some operators to, to handle late aggregates, so we can write them nicely to MySQL. Uh, we have some syncs that are actually flat maps <laughs> that write data to MySQL and also tell the system that, OK, this processor started writing to this table. So we can uh, show this on the front end. We have the Kafka outputs, and we also have a sync that pushes the metadata or the summary collected about each script back to the REST API where the front ends uh, can query it. So uh, to wrap up the presentation and leave some time for questions, RBI makes uh, streaming analytics accessible to everyone at, at King. Uh, we leverage Flink's uh, stateful and windowed capabilities, and we, I, we believe that we push the the framework to its limits uh, in many sense. Uh, but the outcome is that people actually love to use this because it's super simple and it's a very nice way to interact with the data that your games produce. Uh, and it's just incredibly, incredibly useful. So thank you very much. And if you have any questions, shoot. Yes? Um, yeah, one question. It seems you're doing a lot in Flink that you could also be doing in like a distributed data store like Elasticsearch or Cassandra. Like if you're doing aggregations in Flink, you can also do this in those. And I'm wondering, like, what's, is there like a reason for doing this, um, forcing the data scientists to write scripts rather than um, using data store queries? Yeah. So. I agree that uh, doing aggregations alone uh, is probably simpler, could be simpler in other systems. But uh, I think the main uh, st strong point of the Arbea is the possibility to track state of the user. And it actually comes up in all sorts of applications. So for instance, think about a case where you want to aggregate revenue per level or any sensible use case. Uh, in the past, this was uh, a very like, heavy join in Hive. But now we can actually leverage the state to record the last game start event, for instance, what a, play what a player made. And then we get a purchase event. We can look up this state, get the last game start to see what level we're on, uh, and actually do the aggregations. So the aggregates itself is, I wouldn't say it's the the core feature of the architecture is more this com combination of keeping state, uh, accessing it in your scripts. Yeah. So maybe that, I hope that answers uh, the question. Yeah. Yes? So how, how would it, would it this be replaced with a streaming SQL where you could also define your jobs as SQL, or how do you compare this? With uh, So you now write Ruby scripts, and then you would write SQL mm. to define your streaming yeah. jobs, right? I mean, many use cases could be replaced by SQL. Then again, if you're trying to keep some more complex like state logic, then uh, you might not want to write SQL. And the other thing about writing SQL is that not everyone writes to do that. So I personally would always prefer to, to write a Groovy class, or even better, a Java class that is actually properly typed and 
Uh, yeah. So it's just a matter of choice. And of course, using SQL like, limits a lot of possibilities that is otherwise doable. Yeah. Yes? Well, it, uh, it's hard to say on average. Or the largest amount. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It's, mm, let's like say like, ten, like maybe less than a, like, like tens, like 10, 20 scripts. But of course, the system is fairly new at King, uh, too. Yeah, so uh, it, we expect this to grow in the future. More wondering about the orders of magnitude. But you say tens, like. Yeah. Uh, it's and my other question is. Mm, do you encounter such situations when your architecture that you don't use custom flink jobs but you you know have groovy script and then compile to mm -hmm. some operators and you have fixed topology mm, did you encounter situations when it was a constraint that for example your data scientist wants wanted to have some wanted to do something that you knew that was mm, possible yeah. in flink but it wasn't because of your architecture yeah. so Yes, of course, those uh, use cases come up from time to time. Uh, but uh, you can also think of Arbea as like an entry point uh, for stream processing to, to, to the data scientists. And if they have written a script that almost does what they want, but they need to like, uh, use some other features that are maybe not available in Arbea, and we don't want to, to implement it, uh, then this is a good point to, to start like productionizing that script, dedicating it a new fling job that actually does only that what they want, and then they then we can add uh, extra features. And at that point, they have a much better understanding on on what they need from fling, and it's much easier for them to develop uh, it afterwards. Thanks. Well, the short answer is uh, there is no role of machine learning in this. Uh, I, I don't. I, I know. I, I don't know any people who are using this in the context of machine learning uh, over the streams or anything. Uh, are you clustering your players? Uh, yeah, there's all, uh, of course uh, player uh, segmentation, but uh, yeah, that's that's uh, in some ways connected to this, but it happens in, in other systems uh, at, at this moment. All right, then thank you again.